Hello everybody, this is Thomas Keegan and today's date is Tuesday, September 4th, 2012 and uh, this, I'm uh, having this uh, interview today with LibertarianProgressive.com where we've been interviewing third party and independent candidates uh, who are on the ballots uh, this 2012 um, for your elections on November 6, 2012. And, um, and today I'm talking to Bill Bloomfield, who's in the 33rd District of California. Uh, his opponent, um, uh, Henry Waxman, is the opponent there. And um, so uh, now in California, you, you do have a uh, what they call a, a kind of a, a special r primary where only two people are going to be on the ballots. Um, uh, so it could end up being two Democrats, two Republicans, two independents, it, it, you know, uh, it could be two whatever. It's just two people are, you know, as many people can run and then um, they have a primary, the top two makes it. And it's called the top two. So uh, and a couple other states have that as well. And uh, so this election year seems to be um, uh, pretty exciting. Um, uh, and, and I think there is a possibility with a 10 percent record low approval rate of Congress um, currently being occupied by the uh, Republicans and the Democrats and uh, the record number of uh, people registered in the country um, as uh, well I don't know if it's a record number but there's more people registered as an independent than there is as a Democrat or a Republican and uh, the uh, environment is just right for um, a lot of independent third-party candidates to sprout up in, in Congress, and um, I think that would send a message loud and clear. Um, if we got 50 plus, it would be, you know, a shot heard around the world, um, as that saying uh, goes. That quotes. Um, and uh, Bill, so it's great to talk to you. Um, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, we you, you start off with um, asking people. Um, why what's their motivation what drives them why, why did you put yourself into this uh, campaign this year instead of just um you know doing something else and and, and uh you, you know not being involved in politics bill and uh so good morning thanks bill good good morning thomas and 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 thank you for the intro and thank you for for having me this morning i, I very much appreciate it I, I tell you what what drives me is is simply a, 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 a very strong concern about the future of our country. Uh, the, we, our country has very serious problems to deal with, you know, starting with a tepid economy and its uh, trillion-dollar-plus budget deficits that uh, Congress basically virtually every day makes a decision that it would rather, uh, they would rather uh, borrow money or print money than deal with our spending addiction and these these terrible terrible deficits that threaten the future of our country, and I didn't want to sit back and uh, not do something. You mentioned uh, uh, open primaries. Uh, California, as you know, uh, passed the open primary initiative in 2010, and so this last June was the first election operating under that new uh, uh, rules. The other thing, however, that's very significant that has happened in California was the passage of uh, redistricting reform. So for the first time uh, in the history of the state, the election lines are drawn by a nonpartisan citizens commission. So it's really the one-two punch of redistricting reform and open primaries that finally will let all voices be heard uh, in, at least in California, uh, for both the, the uh, offices uh, for Sacramento as well as Washington, D.C. I have been working very hard, or had been working very hard, on both of those movements, both redistricting reform and open primaries. And it, uh, it, it, it not only uh, am I running because I am so worried about Congress, but also running because of the reforms that passed in California, uh, I have a real opportunity. We have a real opportunity of winning. And as you said, it will be the shot heard around the world. And it will encourage uh, other states to pass both redistricting reform and open primaries. And most importantly, uh, send a powerful message to the other 534 people in Congress 
that at least in California, which makes up about one-eighth of Congress, one-eighth of the population of the country, that, you know, we can now hold all politicians accountable and we'll hold them accountable for what gets done, not for their rhetoric, not for their politics. Political bickering, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, well, it, I, sorry, to interrupt. The, the redistricting. Just to follow up on that, um, was that something that you had to pass in your states with a um, initiative, or, or is that something that yes. people just? It is okay because we had. Uh, and like unfortunately, it didn't pass yet, but we're working on it. So yeah, maybe that's a good sign. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the states that uh, that don't have the initiative efforts at their disposal, it's really hard to ask the majority power to willing a uh, party in power to willingly give up their power. So it wasn't your and, state house that passed it. It was an initiative from the people that actually ha- get got the redistrict. It was an initiative from the people. Now my involvement started at a at a major uh, 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 way in the 2005 effort. It was one of Governor Governor Schwarzenegger's five initiatives that he had on the ballot in the 2005 special election. And it was the one that was, I thought, the most important was to take the hands of redistricting out of the hands of the uh, politicians and put it in the hands of the people. Uh, I put a lot of time, effort, and money into that unfortunately failed effort. But it was the people put it right back on the ballot three years later in 2008 to cover uh, the state races, Assembly and State Senate. The feeling was that if they covered the House, that with the the uh, Democratic National Party against it, it would be too much. And so by only covering Assembly and State Senate, they were able to, it was able to pass because the opposition was a little muted in November of 2008. And then it came right back two years later to just cover Congress in the November 2010 election and passed. And so it, it's really the, the, and the open primary uh, passed in the June 2010 election. And what was interesting and significant about that, Thomas, is that that passed despite opposition of both the California Republican Party and the California Democratic Party. And so both parties worked to, uh, to defeat it and were unsuccessful. The well, people, why, why would they uh, want to defeat that? I mean, did, what were their arguments like? Uh... Well, their arguments were it should be up to the members of the party to choose and decide who represents them. Uh, some of the, uh, and and didn't like the fact that uh, anyone could vote for anyone they wanted because really it, it does it, it does open primaries reduces somewhat the power of the political parties in terms of deciding and as you know even with redistricting reform you still have a lot of districts that are going to be heavily weighted either in Republican side or Democratic side. And what happens, of course, then, the real decision on who's going to represent that district happens at the primary level. And if you have a closed primary, so you have a situation, so you have a, a safely Republican seat, and you have a closed primary, then it's only the Republican primary voters who get a choice. And if it's a closed primary, that means the independents, the, the members of the minority parties, smaller parties, or, nor Democrats have a, have a voice whatsoever in who represents the district. And then what compounds that is because the primary is not the final decider that officially uh, 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 anoints the winner that very few people even bother to turn out in primaries. So you have a small portion of one political party ending up making the decision on who goes to Sacramento and who goes to D.C. And unfortunately, the group that will, will tend to turn out in mass in a primary are the extremes on both ends of the political party. Oh, for the you're, simple you're right. reason I for mean, them, we wouldn't even need that unless if the t- major two parties weren't stenched, I mean, entrenched in uh, power and, 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 you know, try to prevent people from getting in debates and stuff like that. So this is a result because of what they've done. It's not something that was even proposed until after they've, um, y- y- you know, kind of dirtied up the whole process already. Yeah, well, yeah. And, of course, really, if you trace it back, I mean, what's the explanation for all of it? It's money. And it's the special interests that have that have infected both political parties. And the one thing special interests have in common is they won't give an inch. 
and so it, it just it, it feeds upon itself. But if we give them an inch, they'll take a mile, right? So, you know, well, see, there you go. And there I think go. there's one other um, independent that, that made it through the primaries, or maybe there's two others um, in, in California as well. So maybe uh, you guys can you know, do, do like a tag team duo and, and get in there. I, I'm hoping that we get at least 50, um, one representing, it's a metaphor, one representing each state. Uh, I mean, there might be two from one state and, and zero from another, but but 50 in all would be, a, I think, a goal for the American populace in, 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 a, in a 2012 um, campaign election where people might this year put aside their, um, you know, Republican, Democrat hats and, and have we the people um, send really a shot heard around the world, which is um, a line that was um, the opening stanza of Ralph Waldo Emerson's Concord Hymn and referred to the beginning of the American Revolutionary War. And uh, and this, in a sense, is a 21st century way where we can vote and, and, and tweet and, and, you know, network uh, together. And, and this could be a shot heard around the world uh, done by the um, emergency break that, con that the founding fathers really put into the, with the wisdom they had into our Constitution by allowing the Congress to represent, I mean, the House of Representatives and the Congress to be, um, to, to be changed every two years uh, yep. in case we really, really yep. need that to happen. I mean, we've been going back and forth, back and forth between Republicans, Democrats owning the House, and it's kind of like eventually people are just going to pick something else. And um, and, and it looks like the, the story of that is happening. And, um, well, well, and don't overlook the fact, Thomas, that, 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 that actually the, 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 it's not going to be the headline story, but in terms of what's really going to change things in California is the, yeah, there, are, there are, I think, one or two other races where there's an independent on the ticket. Now, having said that, and those other two races, there are only two candidates in the primary. Right. So, uh, but the independent may win. But what's also going on is there, there's at least 20 races in the general where it's either two Democrats or two Republicans. And so if, in fact, you have some of those cases, and I'm sure there are quite a few of them, where the, the, uh, one of the, uh, the two candidates is more extreme than the other, there's an opportunity for people that are either more pragmatic or more centrist Oh, or members of the opposing the party to get involved. Exactly. And so you, you have that as well. If, if the, the two-party system has, in fact, worked fairly well up until recently, and if we, can, if, if we have an opportunity, I mean, the main thing is, to, I think, to give the voices to everybody, have everybody, all the voters in the country make yeah. the decision on who represents them. The and, and, you know, I mean, look, look at, look at the time in, in when Reagan was president. Uh, you know, it was a two-party system. You had Democrats and Republicans. But what was the difference? The difference was Tip O'Neill and Reagan made themselves like each other because they knew they had to work together because it was in the country's best interest. What is happening now is the leaders in Congress, if you're not in the same party, they don't like each other, and they don't, they don't act like they like each other, more importantly, or even more importantly, they're not willing to get together and put the best interests of the country ahead of their own personal distaste, perhaps, for the other person. And, 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 and that's the difference. If we can get back to a system where you can have a presidency, and I'll just pick one, the Reagan presidency, where you have the other party controlling the House during the entire eight years, and in fact, an awful lot of stuff happened, you know, that's what real, isn't that really what we want? Well, Where, right. just, if you want the results, we want a government that works, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, you could argue true bipartisanship would be everyone just being an independence and, and, and shedding well, their uh, the Democrat. Repu I mean, the Democrats and Republicans, um, they've uh, been in power so long and, and have gotten so corrupted and have gotten such a low approval rating. I, I mean, I'd almost consider them two special interest companies that have... Uh, in, invaded. I mean, they, they were they, they started out as political parties, but nowadays I could almost consider them a special interest that uh, has uh, too much influence in Congress, and um, and we need to get them out. They've turned into a special interest instead of being a party um, for the people. I mean, we're spending millions, hundreds of millions of dollars for security. Um, I mean, they they pass for for these conventions where we know who's going to be the winners. I mean, do they really need that? Plus. Um, I yep. mean, and that's... Yeah, there, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Thomas, there you go. Yeah, I was at an event uh, a woman held for me a few weeks ago, uh, and we were chatting before, and she, 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 her eyes were moist uh, when she looked at me, and she said, Bill, where did my party, she's a Democrat, where did my party 
get education so wrong. And I and I and I, I told her. I said I said I said Heidi, it it isn't your party as much as it's follow the money, and that the problem in this particular case, the special interest we're talking about, of course, is the political arm of the teachers union. And it isn't that Democrats don't care about education and reforming education. It's that the Democrats in power are not able to act on what they would want, which be would be to reform education, at least the majority, because so much of their funding comes from the political arm of the teachers' union. And so you have candidate people like Senator Dianne Feinstein who muses on a flight to a reporter that she's really worried about the growing power of the political arm of the teachers' union, which is stifling education reform in our country. But the question is, is she doing anything about it? And the answer, of course, unfortunately, sadly, is no. Yeah, unfortunately, um, and, and let's get to some issues. I'm going to bring up one issue uh, really quick, and because you just mentioned Diane Feinstein, that reminded me of it. Um, it is is uh, in, in, on December 31st, uh, 2011, um, uh, I, 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 something bad happened uh, to, to America. There was um, <clears throat> the National Defense Authorization Act was signed. Now, she said she opposed it, but she ended up voting for it anyways. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that uh, needs to stop. People saying that there's a lot wrong with this and still voting for it. I mean, especially when it has some extreme as that. And if um, Now, every year there's a National Defense Authorization Bill, but th they attach things to it. And, and, and that's the problem that was wrong with this. Now, um, there's... Um, Glenn Greenwald wrote an excellent article about, um, and he titles it, Three Myths About the Detention Bill. Um, and uh, those myths are that this bill does not codify um, indefinite detention. If people believe that it does not codify indefinite detention, here's where he um, explains how it actually does codify indefinite detention, that the bill does not expand the scope of war on terror as defined in the 2001 AU MF um, and uh, and also that it um, the myth number three is United States citizens are exempted from this new bill, which is false. Now it is going through courts, but I mean that's this um basically this changes the playing field. This this gets rid of the rule of law. We're talking about the rule of law right now with this enacted. They put in anarchy. They're the ones who are the who are anarchists um, because this really gets rid of rule of law. This lets the government. Um, just pluck people up indefinitely without them ever uh, kind of like um, you, you know what you might have heard from the old like Stalinist Soviet Union and actually she voted for it some um, in the Senate they had their own version of this um, Henry Waxman uh, voted for this um, in California a he voted a on this there are a lot of de Democrats and Republicans who voted against this but um, but I'm just, I just need to ask you, sir, uh, what are your thoughts on on this uh, bill that had passed, um, you know, about uh, nine months ago? Um, and uh, do, do you think there's, uh, you, you know, so, something we should do about that? Or what are but your Tom, thoughts? Tom, what, what I will comment on, what, there's something we should do about it is the fact that that we need to stop the cycle of people in Washington playing politics 24-7 and making a vote for appearance sake, which isn't the vote that matters, and then sneaking in a vote that matters so they can say they voted yes and then quietly don't say before they voted yeah. no or the other way around. I am not an expert on that particular bill. I mean, I look, you know, it, President Obama ran about on, on office saying that he was going to deal with Gitmo and close the... And, and, and close the, the, the Cuban base, it's, you know, it, it, the, the, the prison there and all that. And then, of course, now he's in office dealing with the difficulties of actually doing that and what the implications are and all that. I am not. That, that is not something that I, I have something to offer. Let's put it that way. I, I don't, you know, I appreciate maybe offline getting your opinion yeah, on I, it. Yeah, I will. I'll send you on some I, 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 yeah. Listen, I... I I'm a businessman my whole life. I've looked on election reform. I don't like what's happening. I don't like the fact that we're sending the wrong people, people to Sacramento that the politicians and the special interests choose, not the voters. And that's what motivates me. That's what drives me. I want people in D.C., if they're going to send hundreds of thousands of men and women to Iraq and Afghanistan, 
put them in harm's way, know full well the thousands of them are going to pay the ultimate sacrifice with their lives in return. Darn it, it is not too much to ask for them to occasionally risk their political life to do the right thing. And if that means they're not going to be reelected, so be it. Yeah. It's a heck of a lot less of a sacrifice than what they're, sent, they're forcing the young men and women to do who uh, they're sending abroad to fight. So that's what motivates me. That's what my focus is. I want to get Congress working. And when Congress is working, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to Manhattan Beach. I'm going to say, I've done it, and if I can do it in one term, I'm going to do it in one term. I absolutely am not looking forward to living in D.C. I love my life in Manhattan Beach. I've lived in this district my entire life. I love everything about uh, where I live. I've got four grandkids about my life, but I'm not going to sit back and see some people who think their job is to pay, play politics 24-7, ruin the country for my grandchildren and their children. And, and you know what? I've, done, I've, I've, I've had some success here in California with election reform. We've got another initiative in November I'll talk about in a second that I'm heavily involved in and I think is going to pass, and I know I can good, do some good in D.C. One of the things I want to mention, by the way, you talk about independence. One of the things I'm going to do, I met with Governor Angus King, who is running, uh, he was not running as, he's an independent. And I correct people, I am not running as an independent. I am an independent. I re-registered a year and a half ago, well before I had any notion whatsoever, thought, idea of running for office. But both he and I, when we get, when we get in office, are going to sit down with the respective leaders, in his case of the Senate, me and the House, and say, darn it, we do not want a caucus. We do not want to pick a side. Right. You put us on some committees where an independent who is free of the special interests, free of the partisan politics, and do some good can do some good. I was going to ask and you hint, that. I, was, I think yeah. hint, I think ways and means would be pretty good. You think about the fact that they need to tackle tax policy. How about having somebody in the House who's on that committee who is completely free of the special interests? And that includes Wall Street, the banks, you name it. Now, Bill, that actually, would I actually want to follow up. I was going to ask you on that because a lot. Some people might not know, but it's not like you can just introduce a bill any time. Um, if if one party controls Congress, then they pretty much um, have a lot of leeway in it. And, and if and that's another big problem besides just the apparatus of owning the debates and, and stuff like that, which you've fixed now. I mean, you pretty much um, pressure them to, they, they have to have debates with whoever ends up in, in after the results of the primaries, which that's that's a real positive change there. Um, that's uh, you've kind of, uh, you, you know, force them, or it should force them to do it. But when you actually get to Congress, that's still another problem. That, that That's why we need to get a lot of people in there. I mean, just two or three independents, um, I, I don't think is, is, is good enough for what we deserve uh, this year, um, uh, w w waking up to this climate um, and trying to change the ship around. I mean, there are other uh, uh, structural things in Congress where they're going to they're going to ask you to pick a caucus, either Republican or Democrat. And I admire that you're not going to pick one. Well, well, look, I'm 62 years old. I'm not going to, you know, I, I, I laughingly point out. I am not going to be serving as long as Congressman Waxman, who is running for his 39th year. No, I won't be there. 39 years. 39. I'm not going to develop a huge seniority through the seniority system. So I, I am not going to let them get away with it. And if they say, if you don't caucus, you don't get a committee, I'm going to say 40% of the American public views themselves as independents. They may not have registered as an independent, but they vote as an independent. They view themselves as an independent, and if, you know, <laughs> I will call on the, 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 the American public to back me up and insist that Congress, because after all, Congress, it's their own club, they make their own rules, change the rules, and accommodate uh, independence and, uh, uh, so that we have, uh, so, so the, the, the voters' voices are heard not only in the election, but also once you get there. Now, having said that, being the one person whose vote they can't count on, that will obviously elevate my power above what a, what a, what an average first-year congressman is. But also, uh, Thomas and I, and I hope that it, you maybe maybe uh, your 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 listeners aren't aware of this group called No Labels that I was uh, been involved with since uh, 2010, and am listed as one of their 30 or so co-founders. 
Uh, it's a group that uh, is already working to reform Congress, and we're hoping by the next Congress that we'll have a caucus, our own caucus, made up of Republicans and Democrats and independents uh, who are what well, we have in common and other is our will and, and others and our willingness in Congress, our willingness to or, or put a priority of solving our country's problems and be willing to work with anyone regardless of party label. And a power, a power of about 40 of us, of Republicans and Democrats, liberals, conservatives, independents, uh, would be the balance of power. And we would be a very formidable force and, you know, stop some of the nonsense and force Congress to deal with issues and, and solve problems. A lot of people don't realize, and particularly I think in this, this, this coming election, you, you perhaps hear this a little bit more right now from Republicans that are thinking, well, our party's going to sweep, and so everything will be fine, and we'll solve everything. And they like to say, hey, they're going to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act. Well, you know, not so fast. No one is forecasting that either party, Republicans or Democrats, will have a filibuster-proof Senate. No one is forecasting that. And so if the Republicans sweep, meaning that, you know, Governor Romney wins and they, 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 they win the Senate and they hold the House, yeah, repealing uh, the Affordable Care Act, they're not going to be able to do it. It's not going to happen because the Democrats will filibuster the bill. They may be able to cut some of the funding. But to the extent that, you're, you're, that, that, that the Affordable Care Act is going to be improved, which everyone agrees there's room for improvement, mm -hmm. it's only going to happen through negotiations and agreement between, uh, amongst Republicans and Democrats, at least for the coming two years. And I, I point out to my Republican friends that the last time the Republicans had a filibuster-proof Senate was 1930. That's 82 years ago. That is a long time to wait if someone thinks that it's going to just take another election or another election. Uh, you know, anyhow. Yeah, and we can even just pass something brand new that, that overrides it, too, instead of just tinkering with what has already been passed. And uh, now, if, if there's 50 people that, I mean, besides just that caucus, which would be great, um, uh, if there was 50 people that were elected that were not Republicans or Democrats, be they third party, independents, whatever, um, that's, um, I mean, uh, I heard someone else say, I mean, the powers that be are just going to have a convulsion. That's going to be too much for them to, to handle. I mean, we will really be um, on the um, offensive at that point, and then in, maybe in 2014 we can get 50 more. Um, because well, yeah, when you talk about Congress, um, un unfortunately, uh, you're, you're, you're a little ways away before you're going to have 50 independents or members of Congress that are not a member of either a Republican or Democratic Party. You and I may agree yeah. that, gee, it's too bad that doesn't happen sooner, but the fact is California, uh, I think Washington State has open primaries. I don't know if they've had redistricting reform, though, because you really need both. And Louisiana, once again, has open primaries. Seems like they change the system every couple of years in Louisiana. But, uh, but, I, but I do think that uh, getting people who there that represent either party, uh, that are members of either party, but are saying, look, I'm a member of the party when I'm running for office, but when I serve, I am an American. And I don't care what your party label is. Let's figure out how to move the country forward. Let's look for win-win solutions. Let's work for solutions that clearly we all agree they'll leave the country better than it is. Uh, my, my comment about the Affordable Care Act is simply that it's what happens when you have one side writing something and the other side is not involved at all. Now, we could argue, and I don't have a position on this, as to whether or not that was mostly the Republicans' fault or the Democrats' fault, that the Affordable Care Act was written strictly 100 percent by Democrats. 
But believe me, a bill that was strictly written 100% by Republicans would have its own issues and concerns. Oh, yeah, sure. And both parties have things to learn from each other, and all members, forget the parties, have things to contribute and things, particularly when you're dealing with something as complicated, difficult, and massively and hugely important as health care. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, it, we, 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 you know here, here's Exhibit A of why parties are important. I'll say Exhibit, I mean, why, why uh, uh, people in Congress need to work with one another regardless of party label. Exhibit B would be the... Uh, 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 the uh, Frank, uh, the Dodd Frank uh, bill to uh, the financial reform, the financial the yeah, situation that they have created so uh, many regulations. It's such overkill, and it's you know we're already seeing signs well, that it's let's, beginning let's go to through strangle a couple the issues, banks. Uh, because uh, yeah, let's hear it. what about Glass Steagall? Do you think that needs to be put back in? To you know something that's a great question. I I would uh, I, I think that we we need to seriously consider that. It clearly. Uh, was a mistake. The question is of over of of, uh, of removing it, uh, removing it, repealing it. The question now: Can you put that genie back mentioned. in the bottle? What I would have done with Dodd Frank was what they should have done. I, I would maintain, and they could have done this in about one page instead of 800 pages. I've, I've done two things. Number one is I would have told the regulators: Look, I'm not going to write a book on what you ought to do. You need to make sure that taxpayer guaranteed funds is secure with enough collateral. Because who knows what these investment banks are going to do and what they're going to come up with as a way to invest the money that we are guaranteeing, we taxpayers. And so you make sure, under all scenarios, that there's enough collateral to protect the taxpayers. And then the second thing I would do would be to, to any bank that's too big to fail, I would break it up. And it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be broken up between investment banking and traditional banking. Maybe it needs to be broken up in 10 different smaller banks. But it's, you know, it's something that's too big to fail is too big, period. Right. And unfortunately, of course, Dodd-Frank hasn't done that. And instead, it's written 800 pages of regulations and rules that are piled upon regulations and rules. And I really fear that, A, the, the, the banks that are going to be able to navigate it, unfortunately, are only the large ones. And that's not good from a competitive standpoint. It's not good from a risk standpoint. And, uh, and then secondly, in the meantime, it's clogging up the banks that, uh, you know, that are, that are stymied and that, that are suffering from these rules and regulations and, and you know, are not lending. Yeah, there, no, there, there's, and Chris, I mean, after he left Congress, I mean, he's got a plush job with his special interests. And, well, uh, there you go, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have commented from the left, the right, um, that, that you know, that that bill, you know, didn't go far enough in a lot of places. It went too far in other places. I mean, it was just, it was yep. like the health care bill. It was just littered with special interests. I mean, the biggest benefit, it's, it's for people who wrote the Affordable Care Act, mostly was the insurance companies, I think, who actually wrote it. Uh, but uh, who knows? Because well, well, you know, look, and don't forget, yeah, it includes a, a, a $15 billion a year payoff to Big Pharma. And, you know, and prohibiting the federal government from negotiating prescription drug prices. I mean, how insane is that? They write the federal it faster government, than you can read it. I mean, I mean. Yeah. The federal government can't say, hey, guys, we want a, we want a bid on 50 billion Zocor equivalent tablets. Right. That's illegal? My Lord. I mean, it's Well, what about it's, it's um, our Medicare prescription that was passed during the Bush administration that doesn't allow us to negotiate prices if we're buying in bulk, you know? Like well, that's what I'm saying. And, that, and the Affordable Care Act continues that. Yeah. And now there is a proposal in Congress to undo it. I'm obviously in favor of it. Unfortunately, Congressman Waxman came out defending, yeah. a, what I say, defending the indefensible. How do you, you can't defend that, prohibiting the federal government from negotiating prescription drug prices. Congressman Waxman recently came out in favor of it. You know, there's something else that we, we haven't discussed. Uh, whenever there's a problem, you can count on Congress to overreact. You know, it's called cover their tail. Yeah. And, and, and oh, no, 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 we, you look what we did. Well, what they do is, of course, they gum up the works. And the one that, the last time they did it prior to Dodd-Frank, and I'm sure there were others, but in terms of doing it big time with Sarbanes-Oxley, 
which of course was the overreaction to the Enron fiasco. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, you know, multi-hundred page regulation rules. What should they have done with Sarbanes-Oxley? Again, two things. Number one, they should have dealt with the problem of off-balance sheet uh, hiding of liabilities. And number two was to prohibit accounting firms from both auditing and consulting the same client clients. That was the, the creation. That's what created the Enron scandal. Uh, yeah. But instead, they passed this morass of rules and regulations, dramatically increasing the cost uh, for a company to go public. And what do we have? What's the outcome? A lot of people don't realize this. In 2002, two-thirds of all public offerings in the world happened in the United States. In 2009, one out of six. Two-thirds to one out of six. That's a market share drop of 75%. And, and this is from The Economist, by the way. And you can zero in on Sarbanes-Oxley. Now, an interesting uh, uh, follow-up to that is a rare uh, act of bipartisanship. Uh, a couple of months ago, Congress passed the JOBS Act, J period, O period, D period, S period. It stands for Jumpstart Our Business Startups. It's a bill designed to make it a little easier for small companies to raise money and go public without the huge cost that Sarbanes-Oxley created. In other words, it's a safety valve to undo a little bit of the damage of Sarbanes-Oxley. It passed the House by 390 to 23, had the support of President Obama, passed into law, passed by the Senate, uh, and, and President Obama uh, signed it. Uh, 23 no votes. Uh, one of them is Congressman Waxman. Wow. Uh, well, yeah. there's uh, th 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 three cases um, to elect somebody new, and uh, and it does seem like whenever there's a problem, Congress instead of doing like the one or two things that would fix the issue, they they end up passing like an eight thousand page bill that 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 there is, you go. and it doesn't even include those one or two things. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, they, 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 the banks have gotten bigger. <laughs> they have a, yes, I know. The banks are, like, they're even more too big to fail now. I mean, they're yeah. even more too big to fail. And, 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 and what we have we done? Instead of the small and mid-sized banks that could have bought up out of bankruptcy, and that could have been the restructuring, that could have been the trust busting by bankruptcy. Um, and, and, and so there's these small and mid-sized banks that um, did have good management. They were the prime people that, that, that should have taken over. They had better management skills. Instead, we totally, um, you, you know, gypped them out of their opportunities to, 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 to take advantage of this opportunity, which they, in, in their sense it could have been if they would have bought up some failing banks and, and they, you know, everything would have went on just fine. Um, we instead gave their money through tax dollars, um, so they're giving their own competitors money to the banks that actually did fail, and, and now they're doing the exact same thing. And uh, you, you know, it's it's it, it, so hopefully, um, I, I don't know. I mean, may, may, you know, hopefully, I don't want to be a doomsdayer, but uh, I mean, they're setting up the situation for it to happen again. And well, well, it's only Wall Street, and perhaps to a little lesser extent, the banks have done a really good job of co-opting both political parties. The, uh, you know, one of the problems I have with my former party is their defense of the, the, some of the craziness of the uh, tax policy. So often the spokesmen from the Republicans, frankly, they sound like Ebenezer Scrooge. But in one area in tax policy where it's interesting that came about from both political parties is, is, is carried interest rule which allows hedge fund managers to pay capital gains on their earned income, which could be tens of millions of dollars a year. And when you look at how that happened, one name that's prominently mentioned is Senator Schumer, Democrat from New York, but of course the senator from New York, from Wall Street, and, you know, undoubtedly, you, you trace the money, you get the explanation for how yeah, the indefensible could actually be... Uh, yeah. Know, Here's another tax policy issue because I, I don't, I don't want to like be too sporadic here, but but there's um, like you, you mentioned it, it introducing uh, initiative referendums in, in the great state of California, um, and uh, they, there are going to be other initiative referendums. Do you think um, at the federal level, like for the the Fed, the federal government should just stay out of certain things? I mean, of course, it's there to protect everyone's. Uh, constitutional rights and that's uh, no doubts but when it comes to things like um, 
uh, drug laws and drug policies and things like that. Do you think that should be just left up to the states and, and the government should just stay out of it if a state has a certain policy they want to pursue on that? Well, I'll tell you as far as I'm prepared to go. There, there's a proposal in Washington. I am not familiar with the, 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 the number of the bill. But it's, it's, the sponsors are Barney Frank, Dana Rohrbacher, and Ron Paul. Yeah. And it's to allow the states to regulate marijuana and have the feds stay out of it. And I am in favor of that. So that would work. For, uh, no, that's great. That's, I yeah, mean, that's, yeah, and, and, and that, that's, as, that's as far as I'm prepared to go. That's as far as I, I, I do think we have to look at the, the, the federal policy in terms of the slaughter that is occurring in Mexico yeah. uh, over drugs and what's going on in the border. Of course, one, one uh, thing we need to do as a response to the drug wars is we need to continue beefing up border security. Uh, it's, it's a national security issue, uh, you know, et cetera. But, but um, you know, that, that, that's where I'm prepared to go. Uh, as we all know, uh, the, the, the problem within this country with drugs is beginning to migrate away from uh, drugs coming from Central America. It's a huge problem, but it's becoming more the chemically made substances in the United States and the abuse oh, yeah, there's, of prescription there's new drugs. Next generation and there's drugs. a huge role there, Thomas, for education, let's face it. No, it, it really that, is. It's you know. one of those, it's like prostitution. I mean, I'm not for that. I think that's an abuse of women, but it, it's an it's one of those, I think, unenforceable laws, as I think Ralph Nader once said. Right. It's just, it's it's right. been going on since the beginning of time. I mean, what are you gonna do? Yeah. I mean, it's it's just trying, like like trying to teach a stubborn dog not to get on the couch. You just can't do it. I mean, it's just they're gonna get up there if if they can, or you, you know, that might be a bad example, but it's just well, one one of those things that um, you know we're. It, it doesn't seem fair, um, and uh, I mean, even President Obama under the same things that he's doing to um, states that want to uh, r regulate themselves, um, y you know, he would actually not even be able to be president. Neither would George Bush or a lot of other politicians who have admitted doing so. Um, and uh, now what about, um, now you did mention a little bit about foreign policy and, 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 the, and the wars, and um, uh, actually, there's two big um, uh, elephants in the room as far as when it goes to the budget. There's uh, Medicare and there is um, our overseas spending. And, um, and then we, you know, some can argue that our biggest military threat is not any um, overseas um, country per se, although, you know, we're on the lookout for that. Uh, but, I mean, in any country that, that, that would attack us would be obliterated, and everyone knows that. So, I mean, but, you know, the mil our budget as one of our biggest um, threats, yeah. national security yeah. threats, I would agree with that analysis. I mean, it, because well, the way it's it, going, sure. it's not sustainable, you know. Well, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta says that the biggest threat to the security of the United States is our out-of-control budget deficits. Uh, and I absolutely agree with that. I, I, fortunately, our foreign involvement if, in Afghanistan is, is winding down. You know, we all have our fingers crossed and hope and pray that it wind, it'll wind down with Some of these Afghanistan like, being what, more stable tours? than it used to be. Yeah. You've got to wonder if our country can afford whatever we're still committing uh, in terms of cost in, in, in South Korea and Germany and yeah. places like that, how much of the bill should South Korea be footing, how much of the bill should other democracies in the, in the Far East be footing. I, you know, those are questions I think need to be on the table, but absolutely. I don't think we need first, that many front troops wars, on that first base. What, excuse me? And South Korea, we don't need that many troops there. I mean, that there we have the technology. I mean, well, we, it's it's. Uh, I, I don't, I, you know, and I, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on it. I don't know how many troops we have there. I don't know yeah. what the right number is. Uh, one, one could argue it wouldn't be a good timing, perhaps to to, to a large reduction. I don't know. Maybe I'm not an expert, and I'm not an expert. And because of that, I want to be careful sure. what I say. But I do know this that if we continue with these trillion dollar budget deficits, the long term future of the United States is not going to be good. And I, I point out to people that uh, as, an, as an example, one of, the reasons, one, of, one of the reasons that we won World War II, there's a whole bunch of reasons, but one of the reasons was that we allowed some very smart people from Germany to immigrate, immigrate into the, the United States 
and uh, like it led to us developing the A-bomb before uh, Germany and Japan. And uh, it's, you know, we need the best and the brightest here in the United States. We need to fund things like cybersecurity. Uh, we need to be sure that the next uh, weapon systems uh, that are, are created or developed by the United States, not so much the, because we need to deploy and use them, but because we need to be able to defend against them because it's not like the United States is going to go on the offensive. I very, get very worried about policies that we take the best and brightest from all over the world. Well, we we did give them a world-class education and engineering, and then we don't let them stay here. Yeah. and force them to go back. Uh, the that, H1N1, it, it, isn't that what you're talking about? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, 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 what is it, H1V, I think it is. Or maybe that's uh, yeah. uh, I, I, I get well, I'm worried about things like that. I get worried about when you, you, know, you talk about the defense budget, how much are we spending on cyber, on, on cyber security, on security against uh, 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 biological weapons, uh, things like that. I'd like to see a program, if we could come up with a way to to ensure that all the citizens of the world had unfettered access to the Internet using satellites or whatever. I think it's one of the best defenses the United yeah. States have against future wars. Democracies uh, don't engage in wars. Yeah, they, everyone should be hooked up to the Internet if they're not already, you know, and um, they, they definitely need to... Uh, you know, experience that for sure. I mean, that's an understatement. Well, and they need to they need to experience it without filters. I mean, Iran has the internet, but they filter out anything right. that that smacks a democracy. The same with China. We we would I would I would want to look at is the technology out there that we could give the people there unfettered access. Oh, I see. What uh, you're saying. So they have information. Kind of like we used to do with like the radio and stuff like that. The radio for uh, Voice of yeah. America. There you go. Yeah, and and, go. and actually, who knows? Maybe the there internet could be transmitted through the yeah. radio. We never know, but. Um, so, uh, and uh, now there were also, you have to, you know, Benjamin Franklin said those who are willing to give up um, their uh, liberty for security will have neither. I mean, there yeah. have been bills passed, I mean, not passed, but tried to be introduced and passed, um, like SOPA and PIPA, which basically they're there to protect um, uh patents uh, and, and, and copyrights, which I, I, I totally understand that. But the problem with those bills and why they um, failed, because so many people called in and prevented them from passing, um, is that, um, is that y you were guilty until you're proven innocent instead of innocent until proven guilty. And then so they could shut you down without any proof, and then you would have to prove your innocence. Um, so it, it kind of turned the whole uh, frame about that around. And actually, as far as civil liberties goes, I mean, habeas corpus, um, y you know, the foundation of uh, uh, our w Western civilization, uh, basically, and, and now the world, um, uh, you know, the evolution from, from the Magna Carta to the United States, um, all, you know, indefinite detention. I mean, there's one thing about being secure, but, I mean, too much security. I mean, I guess, you know, if uh, terrorists hate us because of our freedoms, <laughs> one way to get rid of that is just get rid of our freedoms, and maybe they won't hate us anymore. It, it appears that SOPA was not, the, this was not the best written piece of legislation. You'd like to think that the players involved would all be able to get together in a room and write a bill that, that did cover the, the safeguards you're talking about, but did address the problem of copyright violations, et cetera, et cetera. But here again, you go back to the long-term health of the United States of America. If we didn't have these trillion-dollar budget deficits, if we were running a balanced budget and our, econ our economy was humming along, we would have a whole lot better negotiating position. We would be in a whole lot better negotiating position with China. And let's face it, a lot of the problem stems from China. And, 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 and the fact that China is, is not enforcing the laws that are that are on the books, or sh if not, should be on the books in China related to copyright violations mm -hmm. and things like that. And it gets back to, uh, you know, issue number one is our budget, our economic health. And, you know, you and I have talked about a lot of things that need to happen. One of the things we haven't talked about, by the way, is how you solve the budget problem. Uh, my number one complaint about D.C. in terms of the leaders of Congress and President Obama uh, and, and perhaps even especially President Obama, was a failure to embrace the Deficit Reduction Commission, his Deficit Reduction Commission. 
Mathis made his report in January 2011. Yeah. It had bipartisan support. Dick Durbin, Democrat, liberal Democrat from Illinois, a Republican Senator Tom Coburn, Republican conservative Senator from Oklahoma, both signed on to it, both supported it. 11 out of the 18 members of the commission supported it. And for no one in leadership role to embrace it, you don't hear it discussed. It is the plan I support. I fortunately believe there's a growing number of people who are supporting it or will support it. But uh, it would be nice, for example, Congressman Waxman, he, does, he hasn't laid out a budget proposal. He, like so many others, demagogued the Ryan budget plan. I'm not a supporter of the Ryan budget plan, but I will tell you something. It's the second best proposal out there, and I would take it to no plan any day of the week. I support the, uh, the, the Bull Simpson deficit reduction plan. We need other proposals. We need well, to I think come it's together a in a nonpartisan yeah, th- manner and get, get our hands around this beast that threatens the future of the United States. And it's not like it, it, it's an economic bill, so it's not like it could have, couldn't have been changed like two years from now if it was really bad. They should have probably just went with that. And, and then, you know, two years, I mean, they, they don't have, you know, that's a kind of a spending bill. They wouldn't have to necessarily. Well, well yeah, yeah, Tom, you bring up something that's uh, one of the things that no labels. In fact, we're having hearings on. We have 90 co-sponsors already is the No Budget, No Pay Act. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, but your, your listeners may not be aware, that uh, Congress has not passed a budget in four years. They don't even try anymore because the two sides, they figure, well, we can't talk, so we don't do it. Even though it's the one job that's mandated by the Constitution, Congress will pass Isn't that why our credit year. rating of the country and, and, went down? Because Well, we you certainly could argue that. Certainly the, 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 the problem of what happened last August, the failure to reach an agreement, uh, I, I think the agency looked and said, well, gee, if Congress isn't working, they can't talk to each other, how will this be solved? Yeah. When will this end? And uh, doing nothing is not helping the situation. And so, I mean, it's a, it was a huge vote of no confidence in the government of the United States. But the good news is we're having hearings. We have 90 co-sponsors of No Budget, No Pay. We simply say, if you don't do your job, you don't pass a budget, why should we taxpayers pay you? We don't care about your political rhetoric. We care about what you do. Uh, you know, the bad news is, is it going to get passed in this Congress? You know, question, undoubtedly no, uh, sadly. But there's a growing number of people supporting it. Well, you know, it, it hurts. And... Um a lot of the budget does have to do with overseas. I mean, I would also put in there Ron Paul's plan, if you know, and, and it's one that he actually at least proposed. You not might not agree with all of it, but um, he actually wrote a full budget, which I think is commendable. And um, but yeah, I, I would. I, I what but what you were saying with the Simpson Bowles Commission, I think that you know why not just do that for two years, and and then that would send a signal. I think the biggest signal that we could send to the world that we're serious. Um, and, 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 and not doing it because of what the world thinks, because of what we think, is um, pulling out of some of these places and, uh, and, re- and reducing our impact there. Either that, either do that or do a Marshall Plan, but it's going to be one or the other, and it's not going to be this halfway in between stuff. And, um, and really tell the world, we're, we're ready to get our house in order. We're ready to work. We're ready to compete. And, well, uh, well I, 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 I'm not, not sure I agree with you. The devil's in the details when we talk about pull out of places. You and I talked a little about South Korea or maybe Germany. But, um, I, again, the devil's in the details. But I agree with you a thousand percent that the message to the world about getting a long-term fiscal health in order. The problem with focusing on Bull Simpson for two years, really, in a way, uh, both parties are wrong. That what's happening is the, 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 the Republicans are, are, have been arguing for cut spending now today. Uh, what in fact needs to happen, and actually in both parties, actually it's more the Republicans been wrong, where in, in a recession you need, to, uh, you need to have some deficit spending to get the economy going again and kickstart it. Uh, well, that's of course, of course, but of course we, to need to, we, need to, we need to put a moratorium on regulations, or at least on regula- new regulations, or at least have a uh, 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 require them to have a... Uh, uh, go through a cost-benefit analysis oh, totally. to make sure the, yeah. the benefits exceed the costs. Uh, yeah, well, it, uh, uh, that, that the, the Democrats have not been supporting. What about small but when you talk about when you talk businesses. about budget, getting the yeah. getting the hands on the budget, what what it needs to happen is we need a long-term plan for that because 
again, where the Republicans have been proposing is cutting back, back spending immediately. Uh, you know, what's going to happen with a fiscal cliff where you have the sequester of a, of a drop in spending of exceeding $100 billion a year, coupled with the tax increases. Most economists are now saying we're going to head for a recession next year. Oh, Bill, that I, would not you're be You're making good. an excellent point. Now, I, I'm flexible as far as that goes. I mean, I'm not, um, you, you know, I, like uh, idealist logic or, or, or an ideologue, but um, no, actually, what we could do if we're if we're going to spend, if we're going to spend, just like I said, like if we're going to spend, uh, then it's got to be for stuff that's constructive and that pays for itself, instead of stuff that's giving money to other countries and ripping us off, and it's just going into stuff that um, mostly destroys things. Uh, like uh, you know, we could transfer like the military is a big um, uh, spender they could be um, you know a big uh, shopping block to um, start buying uh, renewable forms of energy uh, to, to to get the ball rolling in that um, they, they they could set the stage for that there we could also invest a lot more in, in the future um, like you're talking about cyber uh, internet and stuff like that um, getting everyone involved having an open internet um, a free internet like you said uh, but we could also invest a lot more in space I mean we just um, have been sending a lot more probes to Mars that could be a huge industry there's a lot of private industries that are thinking about starting tourism up there um, you know, that's it's a new frontier. I mean, you know. Well, well I, I like you. Know, I, 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 well, I can't say like you, Thomas. I don't know your age, but a big part of my youth that I remember positively in the '60s, of course, was the space uh, race and the, the the NASA, the Gemini program, the. Um, uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and, and leading to the, 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 the moon landing in 1969. And, and I lament the fact that we don't have a manned space program out there. I realize it's usually expensive. Thank God it works for Mars for places itself. like that. Yeah. It does. People don't measure. When they measure the cost, they, they fail to measure the, the psyche of, uh, of, of not only Americans, but everybody in the world, how it encourages people to take math and science classes, uh, it gives them a spirit of optimism, a hope right. for the future. All of that gets lost. And, you know, it comes back to, again and again, you mentioned, like, defense, being able to buy alternative energy. That's, that would be a good thing, except the problem is alternative energy right now in the short run costs more than the, the good old-fashioned in the carbon-based energy, yeah. and there it goes back to, can we afford it? We can all agree perhaps it's a good thing, but we're not going to be able to afford it when we have trillion-dollar budget deficits and a tepid economy. We've got to get our economy going. We've got to get our budget in control because then there's a lot of neat things we could do for our, 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 our country, for our, our, our citizens, and frankly for the world. But it all hinges on dealing with the budget, and it all, which all hinges on getting people in Congress to act like Americans and not like partisan politicians when they're back in D.C. Well, yeah, and, and we could transfer a lot of the military part to a lot of these things um, because uh, – it, it's the, the the spending. People are scared. Like if we quit spending, that's going to take a lot of uh, y y you know dollars and people's jobs out of the market. Well, you know maybe transfer some of these people to doing some of those things um, instead. And uh, and you know just like Kennedy did when he sent up uh, the man to the moon. And um, I I mean that created a lot of industry um, that probably created the computer information age that we're in right now and um, uh, so there were a lot of offshoots clearly to the NASA program absolutely yeah. agree with you I agree with you 100 percent yeah all right so um, there so I, any issues I haven't brought up yet that that you think um, need to be addressed and uh, and then we'll go to some final questions here Bill yeah I, I worry about Iran I worry about um, our country saying that we've got all this time to deal with Iran. I, I am very concerned that our country's uh, policy toward uh, dealing with Iran is based on an election timetable. I think the world, as we, as we know, it changes when Iran achieves nuclear capability. I fear it's not very far off. The administration is telling Israel and the world that, oh, we've got some time, let the sanctions work. Well, I think the sanctions need to be beefed up and, you know, faster. Uh, they, they need to be doing more. 
Uh, yeah, I think the world as we know it changes when Iran achieves nuclear capability. And for the life of me, I don't understand why or how our intelligence service all of a sudden got so good. It wasn't that long ago that we missed the well, that you know that we thought. Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. It wasn't that long ago that we thought North Korea was a few years away from achieving nuclear capability. Are you going to try to find out all that's going on? Because there's a lot that the public probably doesn't even know what's going on, and, and so I think we have a right to know. I mean, well, it, you know, it, we have a right to know if it's in our best interest to know it. We don't have a right to know if it's not. I think national security interests need to be kept as, you know, close well, to Well, we're best. electing you as There's, a representative. What about at your level as a representative? Do you think you should it, be it, able it, to know it, everything? Oh, well, I, I, you know what? I, I don't know. I think I representative. Well, let, me, let me answer it this way. How good is four, or 535 members of Congress at keeping secrets? I worry about that. I hear what you're saying. Well, you're jury saying the ideal. If, if you pass the if you if you pass the rule that the law that if you blab, you end up serving time in in prison. Well, then maybe you could get to that point. But as we know, the leaks that are coming from this administration, it's not good. It's not in the best interest of the United States. So uh, I I don't know. I my my concern is. You know, as I said, is I'd like to think that we know exactly what we're doing and we're putting it clearly on the best interest of the United States and, and our close along. ally Israel in our Iran policy, and it has nothing to do with the election calendar, and I fear that's not the case. Well, you could pass some kind of law where, um, you, you know, someone leaks something that there could be consequences in certain situations i mean now that law would have to be very public what you know the law and the principles of that law would be that would have to be debated yeah. but that that's a possibility i think um because um after all i mean it it, it it's this you know civilian military um now you're right i mean of course you know we're not naive there there are certain strategies i i think maybe we should look um at a playbook that says you know what we're going to show you our playbook um, and uh, and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. Um, we're just going to run it right down the middle, and we're going to tell you right before we do it. Um, and uh, but um, now, let's see. Uh, well, I, one thing I do want to ask, um, and this is always a fun question, and uh, I, I think is, um, what are some of your favorites, um, past uh, political figures, and um, uh, or it doesn't have to be political figures, but historic figures. Um, you know, someone uh, that, that uh, you find either interesting, maybe inspired, maybe someone you don't like at all, but um, uh, that, uh, you, you know, so that you might have been thinking about lately. Well, Senator, you know, I have a great question in terms of, in terms of people in Congress. Senator Joe Lieberman, I think very, very highly of principled person that withstood the, you know, the, the backlash of his political party in terms of uh, taking a principled stance. On Iraq, I don't care if you agree or disagree. He clearly was somebody that put country ahead of partisan politics. Um, and I, I like I like politicians with backbone that stand up to what they believe in, and communicate and lead the country rather than trying to follow. And the last uh, man in the White House that I could say did that and was good at it was President Reagan. Uh, he he knew what he wanted to do. You know, he wanted to, as he said, his idea of, of the Cold War was, or whatever it was, was that we win, you lose. He knew what he wanted to take the country. He said it. He led the country in that direction, and the outcome speaks for itself. Uh, I, I, I think we need that in our leaders. We need them to have backbone, and we need to have them to have the ability to lead the country rather than take a poll and respond. And, and, and it, it, it just, I, 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 it really concerns me that there's too much poll taking going on by people in the White House as well as people in Congress. They should do the best they can. It is up to them to lead the country and sell the country on the direction they want to go. They need to have that skill set. Uh, President Clinton had that skill set. President Reagan had the skill set. Uh, my, my little disagreement with President Clinton would be that I felt at times he spent a little too much time taking polls. Uh, as far as the president, the person I admire probably the most would be Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, uh, you know, came in and he, he took on big business. And, uh, you know, and obviously was, was a big conservationist. 
Um, so th those would come to mind. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's he ha he has actually a lot of interesting quotes too um, that yeah. I like. I, I would say in the House, by the way, the the last great Speaker of the House we had, Tip O'Neill, uh, led his caucus well, but led the country better. Uh, since that time, we have we have fallen into politics more and more and more. Uh, Speaker Wright was, was, a lot of people think, was the start of the problem we've got today of bringing too much partisanship into into uh, the House. Oh, and I forgot to ask you, there's two things. Um, uh, actually, on um, uh, the uh, uh, pro-choice, pro-life um, debates, um, I'm sure people would want to know your position on that. Uh, I, I am pro-choice. Okay, and... Um, uh, health care. Um, what, what, what do you think is um, the solution for health care? Well, the, 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 the Affordable Care Act, and you could, you could tie it into Medicare because the Affordable Care Act, of course, impacts Medicare. They're taking a lot of money out of Medicare to justify the funding for the Affordable Care Act now. Uh, the things I like about the Affordable Care Act are things I don't like about it. I like the fact that it, it ends the problem of people with pre-existing conditions who are unable to buy insurance. Like the fact that kids under 26 can stay on their, their their family's plan, the fact that it sets up the mechanism for buying insurance across straight lines is a good thing. Uh, it introduces some cost control to Medicare. Uh, it starts to end the tax deductible ability of gold plated plans. Uh, I, I think that's uh, a good thing. It, it increases some requirements on preventative care, which is in the country's best interest. That's a good thing. Uh, some of the things I don't like about it, front and center, we can't afford it. It's, uh, it, it's um, you know, it, it, it's, it's terribly costly. It's a lot behemoth. of the costs have been back, back ended. It's, it doesn't do anything or enough to hold the line on the spiraling costs of health care. Uh, there's that $15 billion a year giveaway to Big Pharma that it perpetuates. The federal government still can't negotiate prescription drug prices. Uh, buying insurance across state lines, it's a clumsy mechanism. Why don't they just allow it? They need to go farther. Ending the gold-plated plans, why didn't they end them? Uh, it, 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 is, it favors uh, big corporations and unions. It doesn't address the need for medical malpractice reform. And uh, then the, the, it sets up a panel to try to rein in the cost of Medicare with a lofty goal of keeping the cost of Medicare uh, increases to 1% uh, or less. Obama wants to make it half a percent or less. But it, the only tool it gives the panel, the Republicans, of course, call it death panels, the only tool they give that panel is uh, to withhold payments to doctors and hospitals. Well, obviously, if that's how you're going to control health care costs by lowering payments to doctors and hospitals, you're going to have a shortage of doctors and hospitals. Duh. It also exists. Very quickly. Very quickly. And, you know, so that, that I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I will tell you in, in a nutshell, Thomas, we will know we are serious about dealing with the cost of health care when we have a rational discussion, not in an election cycle, about end-of-life care. As President Obama said when he ran for office four years ago, he pointed out that his mother, after she was diagnosed with a terminal illness, had hip replacement surgery. And his comment was, I'm not sure our country can afford that. Well, you know what? That is what we need to be discussing. And no one is talking about it yeah. because it's an election cycle. Well, uh, why, why not? I mean, discuss it, I, you know. Well, I just it. did. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay. and, uh, I do not call that panel death panels. I think I have a 90-year-old mother who has Parkinson's, cancer, and a terminal illness, old age. And I have a 41-year-old nephew who is the father of an 8-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 13-year-old, and, a and he is fighting cancer. It very much concerns me and bothers me no end that our health care system may, in fact, spend a whole lot more money on my mother uh, uh, you know, over the next year or two than on my nephew. 
Well, I, I mean, and there could be, you know, we need to keep thinking about that and brainstorming because there could be lots of other solutions as well. Um, I mean, there also is, like you said, an interest um, in the pharma industries and probably other industries too um, to, uh, to, to, to not... I, let, let me interject one thing, Thomas. Yeah. The, the public is loud and clear on one thing. They like the form of Medicare. So you think and, we should have a public And one option? of the reasons I am against the Ryan plan is by introducing the vouchers, et cetera, is not what the public wants. Right. What the public needs to hear is what the cost is going to be to keep it the way they like it. And somebody needs to say this is what we're going to do. And one of the things that's going to need to be done in order to keep it the way they like it is the notion that the Affordable Care Act introduced was the panel to look at what we can afford to spend on end-of-life care. Uh, we're going to have to look at means testing, uh, things like that. There's a lot of things that need to be done. But I don't like it when one party or the other tries to convince something, somebody, the public, of, of something that they get. It's like the argument years ago when the Republicans wanted to privatize uh, Social Security. Well, the fatal flaw in privatizing Social Security is the fact is Social Security is a pay-as-you-go system. It's not a Ponzi scheme. It's a pay-as-you-go system. The problem is that it wasn't sold as that, and we've been lied to for 70 years by the, by the, by the politicians. And you get a statement, and your money's in your account. Your money's not in your account. Your money has been spent to pay for grandpa's retirement. And, and that's okay if people know that's what it is. So the idea of privatizing it, the big problem is if you take the 25-year-old's money that is going into Social Security to pay for grandpa's retirement, and you take that money and you invest it so he has a privatized account, who's going to pay for grandpa's retirement? That's the problem. Oh, and yeah. they, were, they were just changing the subject. Well, you've got to pay for the people who you promised, and that includes everybody who's worked in this country. And so it's like, well, we've got to pay as you go system. Now, fortunately, Bull Simpson, Obama's Deficit Reduction Commission, does a fabulous job of dealing with Social Security. It doesn't cause any real pain. Gosh, it adds a re one year to the retirement age in 2050, another year in 2075. I mean, it's, it's almost laughable if it wasn't so serious yeah. how easy it would be to save Social Security. Anyhow, I'm just, no, sorry. no, no, that, that's so an excellent point. I'm glad <laughs> you made that point. Um, I haven't really heard that point uh, be brought up yet, and uh, that's a good point. Um, well, uh, so, uh, Bill, uh, good talking with you. It was a pleasure, um, and, and uh, we'll be you know, keeping a watch on your uh, election here and uh, can't wait till 2006, which I, I still think that, you, you know, it, it's, it's things can turn around fast. There's, it's kind of like the silent shopper story. And uh, um, I, I mean, they can start to. You're right. It does take, uh, you know, a while. It could take 10 years, but, you know, to, but we can get a lot of people elected um, to Congress. I mean, just by, you know, knowing our options and, and making that choice and, 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 and doing, um, not being afraid to do what's uh, in our best interest, basically. And Thomas, just to be sure, we're, we're, we're on the same page. I am not asking the voters in my district to wait years and years and years to get Congress working. This election is going to be hugely impactful, and I believe I can make a difference by winning this election back in Congress in the next Congress, the 113th Congress, I think we can get it more productive. I think we can get it more bipartisan. I think we can move the ball forward. And this election is going to, and Angus King's election and others, people are going to, as you said, the, the shot heard around the world, there people are going to respond to that. Now, what I, what, I, what, I, what I was saying was, when are we going to have 50 independents in Congress? You and I may agree to disagree. Oh, that's, that's okay. Great. We'll see what happens. But open primaries, redistricting reform, let's get it in the other 49 states. No, I think um, uh, and I, that's, that's fine. That's what we're all about. And, and, and just um, having an honest uh, conversation here. And uh, so, uh, well, Bill, I, I will say goodbye to you off the air. I hope you have an excellent day. I know it's, it's the day after Labor Day, so the campaign is on. And so um, on to victory for we the people. Thanks a lot, Thanks. Bill, and I'll say goodbye to you. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Take care. Bye-bye. Yep.